Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 to 10 and then it'll be chapter 2 as well. This is Paul to the church of Galatia. He says, I am shocked, verse 6. I am perplexed in another language. Same, same thing. I'm just undone. I, I can't believe it. This is horrific news. I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God. Oh my word. You have come to a place in your life where you were set apart by the deliverance and the mighty power of the cross. You are set apart and I am completely undone. How you, from receiving this, have now turned to a different gospel. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news. How is that for a paradox? So how can you turn away from something that is good news to another good news? Paul's making a point. There's either good news or there's bad news. There's no good news and good news. There's one good news. But that good news calls you to repentance. And it calls you to remain in repentance. This is Paul's issue with the church of Galatia. He spent so much of his... He's, he poured out his heart into this church. But it is not the good news at all, family. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone including us, even me, or even an angel, a supposed angel from heaven, by the way, Angelos, doesn't necessarily mean a deity, Angelos is a messenger, it could be an angel or a messenger sent from heaven like a prophet, there's so much you can read into that, but let's just give it uh, for the moment, say, let's just say an angel appeared, it wouldn't be an angel from heaven, it would be an angel from, from Satan, what does he say? Even me, if I preach to you a different gospel, even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of evangelion, good news, that we preached, let him be accursed. I say again what we have said, if anyone preaches any other good news than the one you received and welcomed, let that pe person be cursed. Damned anathema, I told you that before. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people. I'm not going to stand here, Paul said, and pretend that I'm going to make the gospel all nice and, and tickling to your ears. I'm not going to do that. So again, that's my mandate. I'm not going to do that. But of God, if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. If I want to be a people pleaser. Now chapter 2 from verse 15 goes to say this. You and I are Jews from birth. We are not sinners like the Gentiles. So it makes a distinct difference. The Jews think they are just automatic Christians. And all us Gentile people are Gentile dogs. You'll never go to heaven. Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Listen to this. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ. Not because we have obeyed the law. For no one, listen to this, for no one will ever be made with, right with God by obeying any law. You cannot come to God on your own basis. I'm a good person. I do, you can go to anyone. Do yourself a favor. Speak to even family. Do you think that you're a good person? I tell you straight away, most people would say, unless you're a depressive person, oh, I'm a bad person. But most people say, oh, I think I'm a good person. Why are you a good person? Well, I've done enough. Given yeah and give no one is good. No one is good. Not even one. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, then we are found guilty because we have abandoned the law. What that would that mean Christ has led us into sin? Absolutely not. Rather, I am a sinner. And if I rebuild the old system that old law that held me in shackles, if I rebuild that, if I am a sinner, if I rebuild the old system of law already torn down, for when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law, so that I might live for God. My old self, now yeah, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body, by trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. That is absolute grace. God did not have to do that. 
He did not have to. He, 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 needs do, he doesn't need to do anything for any one of you, including me. He doesn't have to do anything for the world. He didn't even need to create man. He didn't have to do that. So he owes us nothing. For if, I, if, for if keeping the law would make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. There was no need. Equally, similarly, if it's cheap grace that makes you think that you're going to heaven, then Christ died in vain. He died for nothing. He died and shed His blood, a once for all sacrifice, so that you would be, and I'm going to get to this, justified and made righteous by faith and faith alone. What faith? A heavenly faith. A faith that opens your heart to see yourself or who you are. And then a faith given to you so that you might carry on. Do you notice Paul's words in his opening uh, uh, statement in Galatians chapter 1? I'm so perplexed that you are so quickly turning from this faith. This gospel. How is it even possible? It was given to you by God himself. I just find it like hard to understand. The key issues of the church, whether it's Galatia or the church of today, perhaps our church, these are the key issues. How do people become acceptable to God? That's the key issue of the gospel. That's the key issue of what they're dealing with Galatia, the church of Galatia. That's a key issue what we're dealing with us today. How do people become acceptable to God? How does God accept you, Claire? How does God accept you, Eugene? Just on that basis, it's impossible even just to think. You'd have to be so self-righteous and so self-deluded that you think that you're just the perfect specimen for God. And what do people need to earn God's favor? What do you need to do to earn God's favor? That's the key issue here. How do you become acceptable to God, number one? Number two, how do you earn God's favor? And number three, how do people become members? Now, I'm not talking about an affiliation. I'm talking about how do you become someone ingrained, a membership of God's body, 1 Corinthians 12. How do you become acceptable, find favor, and be part of His body, whether it's here or across the world? For Paul, the answer is very, very simple. There is nothing at all that anyone can do to earn favor with God. You, 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 just stop it. There is nothing you can do. I don't care if you go give out free clothes to a squatter camp. You will not earn God's favor. In fact, I need to say this again. I need to say this emphatically. Those who are in sin are enemies of God. So there's nothing you can do to earn God's favor. I'm sorry. It is only through Christ and which, well, that which Christ has done and accomplished. His, and he has the word propitiation. What does that actually mean? A satisfaction. A call. A, to satisfy God's wrath. That's what Christ did. That, family, is the central and most fundamental thing on which the gospel hangs. It's that Christ atoned for the sins of the world. From past to present and for whosoever he shall call in the future. It is paid for. But it's paid. And here's the part I want to get home. It's paid for those who really belong to him. If you do not belong to him, your lifestyle will exude it. It will flow out. The church needs to stop doing what they're doing. We need to stop reveling in sin. And if, if I want to say this emphatically, it's again, we don't come to the cross by law, we come to the cross by faith. It's a faith that supersedes the law. It's a faith that's given you, to you by God so that you might obey His law. 